Hello everyone, my name is Sergio Lopez and I work as a software engineer in the virtualization team at Red Hat. And here I'm going to talk about libkeyrun, uh, more than a VMM, in dynamic library form. So the first question we need to answer is what is libkeyrun? And if I had to uh, define it in a single quote, that would be that libkeyrun is a dynamic library that enables other programs to easily gain KVM-based isolation capabilities with the minimum possible footprint. Among Likaran goals, we can enumerate that we want it to be easy to use, to integrate all the features needed for its purpose with minimal external dependencies, to be as small as possible in code size, which means uh, to implement the minimum set of required features, but also to have the simplest implementation of those features. Uh, we also want it to have the minimum possible footprint and to provide a friendly environment to, for microservice and container workloads. What we don't intend it to be is something that supports conventional virtualization workloads. In other words, Likaron is not a replacement for QMU, nor VirtualBox, nor any other VMN out there. Likaron integrates a number of components distributed among two libraries. The main one, Likaron, integrates C bindings to interact with the library itself. A simple virtual machine monitor based on Firecracker and Rust VMN crates. Some Arch dependent devices an integrated VitaIFS server and a minimal set of VitaIO devices, which are VitaIO console, VitaIFS, VitaIO balloon, but just the free page supporting feature, and VitaIO VSOC. And provided by Likaround firmware, uh, we have a minimal interface uh, to access the guest payload, and a bundled minimalist Linux kernel has the default payload. Now, some of you may be wondering uh, why implement a VMM as a dynamic library. So let me explain this with an example. Uh, let's imagine you have a runtime and you want that runtime to execute a VM. In this case, using an external VMM. Uh, it, what the, the runtime will need to do is to locate the VMM binary through the file system, and possibly this VMM uh, binary will need to locate other components also through the file system, such as other libraries, like an image, maybe some firmware. This is not a problem on itself, but it may become one if the runtime intends to switch between different namespaces. So let's imagine the runtime has switched to a different point namespaces. Namespace. Uh, in this case, the runtime won't be able to locate the VMM binary. And even if you will, the VMM binary will be able to locate its own dependencies. Uh, this means that the runtime will need to somehow carry all the VMM and all its dependencies between one point namespaces, which is complicated to do and not very efficient in any way. So what happens with the around? With the around, the runtime is linked against the, the, um, the dynamic libraries. So the moment the runtime is executed, the uh, dynamic loader brings the around and the around free work with all the components inside the process memory map of the runtime. Uh, this means the runtime can safely switch, switch between different uh, namespaces, including more important namespaces, knowing it will carry with him all the dependencies it needs to run the lightweight VM. Okay, switching to another topic. Uh, some of you have probably noticed that when I listed the Virtio devices integrated in the round, there was no support for uh, Virtio Blow, Virtio SCSI. So how are we doing storage with, uh, without block devices? So we are using VirtualFS to use any directory on the host on the host has the guest root file system. So what's happening behind the scenes is that well, every time the guest operating system issues a file system request, this file system request is relayed to the integrated integrated VirtualFS server, which is running in the context of the runtime. And this VirtualFS server acts on behalf of the guest by accessing a directory on the host file system. The advantage of this mechanism is that uh, it requires zero storage management, zero storage management. So you don't need to create images, shrinking, growing them. You don't need to partition them or layer a file system on them. It allows to easily share files between the host and the guest out of the box because it's basically how it works by default. It's very friendly to microservices or container workloads for the previous reasons. And the problem with it has is that the performance is not as good as when using block-based devices, basically because uh, you can't rely on the cache of the guests, so which means you need to uh, go more frequently to, uh, all the way through the host to access to request data data. 
But on the other hand, this is good for our memory footprint because we avoid polluting the guest memory with the file system cache of the guests. And the other problem is that the attack surface is larger than using Vitaio block because it requires more code and more syscalls. That said, the ACB enabled version of Blinker ROM replaces VirtuFS with Virtio block. Uh, mainly it's because it's better suit, uh, suited for running confidential workloads. It's smaller, requires less, fewer syscalls, and allows us to rely on LUX2 for integrity and encryption, which is great. Um, we will be talking more about this on uh, the uh, Don't Pick Into My Container talk, which follows this one. Similarly to what happened with block devices, among the leaks of Vitaio devices supported in Lickerum, there is no support for Vitaio Net. So how are, we doing Vitaio, how are we doing networking without network interfaces? Well, in this case, we are using a novel technique, which is called Transparent Socket Impressionation, or, or, or TSI. And what happens with it is that when, uh, when the user space application running on the guest requests the kernel for an AFE net socket, the guest customer provided with an AFTSI socket instead, which has home compatible semantics. And this AFTSI socket uh, integrates both a BSOC and an inert personality within it. Uh, this all happens in a completely transparent way for the user space application, which doesn't require any kind of modification to specifically support TSI. Okay, so now we have a user space client that has received this uh, TSI socket instead of an init socket. And let's say, uh, let's say that this user space client wants to connect to a local endpoint, to do, a, a server that is running within the, the context of the guest. What will happen is when it's the, uh, this client is used the, the syscall to connect, the TSI socket will attempt to fulfill that request using this, uh, its init personality and since there is a user space server uh, listening uh, on a port on, uh, on the local context inside the guest, this connection, this request will be fulfilled immediately and the connection will be successful. And both the user space client and the user space server will communicate between them the usual way uh, without any knowledge that they are happening, they are going through a TSI socket. Okay, now let's make things a little bit more complicated. And let's imagine this user space client attempts to connect to a server that is running outside the guest, to an external endpoint. Okay, the, what happens at, at first is the same thing as before. The user space, user space client will call to connect on the TSI socket. The TSI socket will attempt to use its inner personality first, but won't find a local endpoint there. So uh, after filing to connect to a local endpoint, it will attempt to fulfill the request using its BSOC personality. This BSOC personality will communicate with an integrated Virtio BSOC, which is running in the context of the runtime. And this uh, Virtio BSOC server will attempt to fulfill the request by connecting to something, to an, an, an endpoint which is outside the context of the guests. Uh, if it managed to connect to a server that is running uh, in this context, uh, it will establish connection to it and we will reply uh, to the uh, user space client running inside the guest to know to let it know that the connection has been established. From that point on, both the user space client running inside the guest and the user space server running outside the guest will be able to communicate between them in a completely transparent way without the knowledge that they are, they are, they are going through a TSI or a BSOC socket. And what happens if instead of a user space client, we have a user space server using a, a TSI socket? Well, in this case, once the user space server calls to listen, the TSI socket will start listening both on the init personality and the piece of personality. So we will have a listening port on the context of the guest, and we will have a listening port outside the context of the guest uh, in the context of the runtime, uh, which is managed by the Virtio BSOC server that is integrated in Lickerun. If we receive a connection from a user space client running on the, inside the guest operating system, this connection will be fulfilled through the inner personality. And with it, if we receive a connection through the uh, from a user space client running outside the guest, will uh, will uh, the connection will be fulfilled through the BSOC personality and through the Virtio, Virtio BSOC server acting, uh, which is acting as a proxy. 
Uh, what are the advantages of this mechanism? Uh, well, for instance, uh, we get yes, uh, we just need a minimal network configuration, basically just the DNS. It allows leak around to act on behalf of the user space application running on the guest without the need of implementing a TCP stack on the in the library. From the host perspective, all connections come and go come from and go to the uh, leak around enabled runtime and are visible in the in the network namespace of the runtime context. And there is no need for network breaches nor IP table rules. And as a result of all of the above, the environment is very friendly to container workloads uh, because, and to the point that things uh, such as Istio sidecars work outside the, box, outside the box without any kind of uh, special support for TSI. Uh, the disadvantages of this mechanism is that it requires support, uh, explicit support for each other's family and there is no support for row sockets. Now that we have learned what Likaran is, let's talk a bit about how you can use Likaran. And the first step will be to uh, obtain Likaran. Um, we already have binary shipped by OpenSUSE Tumbleweed. Uh, there is a copper repository for Fedora. There is a homebrew repository for macOS M1, which uses the hypervisor framework instead of KVM. And you can, of course, build it from sources. Uh, the project is, is hosted in the containers organization on GitHub. Once you have obtained Glicker Run, you will get a, a header which contains the, all the documentation for each function. You also get a couple of libraries, but you only need to worry about Glicker Run itself because it will bring Glicker Run freeware into the mix. And linking can be as simple as this example we have that we have here with GCC. This is a minimal example of a program uh, using Glicker Run to execute the VM. It's obviously uh, ignoring any kind of error checking. It's just for for uh, illustrate how simple it can be to create a VM with uh, with the run. And basically, what's happening here is that the program is uh, first creating a context for establishing the configuration of the VM. Then it's configuring the VM to use a single vCPU and 512 megabits of RAM. Then configures the root FS uh, directory to be used as the root file system for the for the guest. Uh, which will be relative to uh, whatever this uh, binary is going to be, this example is going to be executed. And then it says uh, slash bin slash sh has the first program that will be executed and the entry point that will be executed within, uh, within the guest. And it is simply starts the kernel passing the configuration ID created before. In fact, you can even copy paste this example into a file, compile it, Create a directory to be used as root file system for the guest. Extract an OCI image into this directory. And then if you execute the binary, you'll get a, right away a freshly started VM running a different kernel than the host. And despite the fact that you don't have any external interfaces, you can, thanks to TSI, you can start a local service in the guest and connect to it from the outside, from the host. Lastly, I would like to talk about some uh, examples of use cases for Rickeran. Uh, we already have some projects using Likaran. Uh, we have Kran VM, which uses Likaran and build that to create that with VMs from OCI images. Uh, we also uh, have CRAN, which uh, is the OCI runtime used by Podman, which uses Likaran to uh, run containers with virtualization-based isolation. And there are all, uh, all the ideas we are already working on, which is has the ability to run fully encrypted workloads using AMD, AMD SCB. And uh, we are also like to explore in the future other ideas such as giving conventional services the ability to self-isolate. For instance, we know that there are HTTP servers that are able to use CH root or namespaces to isolate themselves. And it would be nice to give them also the ability to uh, isolate them in a full VM without any kind of uh, maintenance of configuration required for the administrator. And another idea that I think would be nice to explore, it would be to uh, have a microservice platform that would deploy functions inside 
virtual uh, isolated context using Lake Run. And this is all I had to share. I hope you enjoyed this session and thank you for listening. Bye bye.